All right. Hello, everyone. We're going to start right now. My name is Xiao Yan Song, and I am the electronic resource librarian at the North, North Carolina State University. And on behalf of the NACE Continuing Education Committee, I'd like to welcome you to our November webinar, Tracking Down the Problem, the Development of a Web, web Skill Discovery Troubleshooting Workflow, presented by Todd Enoch. Before the presentation, I have a few quick announcements. First, this webinar will be recorded, and anyone who registered for the webinar will receive a link to the recording via email shortly following the webinar. Second, if you have any questions for Todd during the presentation, please enter them into the WebEx Q&A box located at the lower right corner of the WebEx window. If you can't see the Q&A box, click on the Q&A icon in the upper right corner of the WebEx window. The Q&A box will then appear in the lower right corner. So Todd will answer your questions at the end of his presentation. And finally, when the webinar is over, you will be redirected to a survey about the webinar. I hope that you will take a few minutes to fill it out and let us know how we are doing, what we can do better, and share ideas for future webinars. And with that, I will introduce our speakers for today. Todd Enoch obtained his MLS from the University of North Texas while working in their library as a staff member, first in cataloging and later in serials. He is currently the head of serials and electronic resources for the UNT libraries in Baytown, Texas. All right, I will now turn things over to Todd. Thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. As you said, my name is Todd Enoch. I'm the head of Joe's Electronic Resources at the University of North Texas Libraries. Uh, this presentation is based on a presentation I did at the NASA conference last uh, earlier this year, and it's basically the same presentation with a little bit of new information at the very end. And so with that, we can go ahead and get started. So a little bit of context about the yeah, University of North Texas. Uh, we're located in Denton, Texas, which is about equidistant from uh, Dallas and Fort Worth. Uh, our enrollment is nearly 38,000, and we have an FTE of a little over 30,000, and we obtained Tier 1 research status last year. Uh, that last bit has absolutely nothing to do with my presentation, but it's a really big deal, so I wanted to mention it. I also want to talk a little bit about web scale discovery. Now, I'm sure most everyone listening has uh, familiarity with it, but just to make sure we're all on the same page, I wanted to just go over what it is. So web scale discovery is a service that indexes material from various sources. So they pull in indexing from a lot of different places, mush it all together, and have it available for people to search. Now, when you subscribe to a web scale discovery product and you do a search, it reaches out to your associated knowledge base. For UNT, our knowledge base is Serial Solutions. And when it queries a knowledge base, it finds out what a full text article your users can actually access. And then the search results that are returned are based off of that. Now, when they look for the results and click on one, the content is then retrieved using an open URL link resolver. And in our case, we use Serial Solutions 360 link. So that way, our, the patrons can do a search and click on a link and be taken directly to the article that they want without having to search multiple different databases for material, in theory. But as we all know, technology doesn't always work the way that we would like it to work. So there are certain places where the web scale discovery product process can break down. And it can break down on the provider side of things. The discovery product itself can have some incorrect metadata or can have some problems with the open URL linking syntax out to other databases. The knowledge base can have some problems as well. Sometimes the holdings information isn't correct. Sometimes they haven't updated the URLs if there have been changes. And the content providers can have problems as well. Metadata issues, linking syntax, a lack of updates to the knowledge base, as well as missing or corrupted full text materials. But it's not only at the 
uh, provider side where the process can break down. It can also break down at the institution or user level. Uh, for the institution, if we don't keep our knowledge base up to date to reflect our changes in subscriptions and holdings, if we don't keep the proxy configurations and our easy proxy up to date as things change at different providers, and if we don't keep up to date with paying our subscriptions, the process can break down. And for users, the process can break down with their personal computers having firewalls, other computer browser problems such as corrupted cookies, and just misunderstanding the results that are provided to them. So UNT first implemented our Web Scope Discovery product, Summon, in 2012. This implementation was done by our user interfaces group. They are the department in the library who's responsible for our ILS, our OPAC, and all of our web-facing materials. So they did a lot of research, and since we were already serial solutions customers, going with Summon seemed like the, the best bet. Uh, my main uh, contribution to the implementation was that as a serial solutions administrator, I was responsible for activating all the databases in serial solutions that would be searchable through Summon. So I was involved with the Summon implementation, but I wasn't the main contact for it at UNT. Uh, one of the things the user interfaces group decided to do was to really scale down the use of Summon that we promoted. So at UNT, Summon is primarily used to retrieve full text peer reviewed journal articles. Now if someone searches in Summon and then gets to Summon, they can play with all the different filters and search uh, anything that they want, but on the library homepage, the only search box for some that we have defaults to full text peer reviewed journal articles. Now, not too long after we implemented Summon, user interfaces did a survey and, re and got a 71% positive response. Now, as one of my coworkers pointed out, that means a 29% negative response, but we decided to focus on the positive that most people seem to be happy with the service. However, a few months down the line, I began to hear things to the grapevine that people weren't really happy with Summon. And basically, the complaint that I heard was that Summon never works, which was a surprise to me because every time I'd used Summon, it had worked fine, and I hadn't gotten any notifications that things were problematic. Well, so I talked to user interfaces and I talked to our technology help desk to see if they'd been getting help tickets about problems with Summon, and they both said, not really. They'd only gotten one or two in the several months that had been working. So the user interfaces group and I met with our library liaisons group, who are our public-facing librarians, to discuss the issues. And we heard from them that there are tons and tons of problems with Summon and that it never works and they don't even like using it for their instruction or reference or anything. And we imparted to them that this is the first that we were really hearing about this in an official capacity and that we really needed people to turn in help tickets so that we could start troubleshooting and try to fix whatever issues there were. And so after that, we started to get some help tickets and we started trying to troubleshoot. But there were some issues with troubleshooting some and the first was that few help tickets were submitted. Uh, even after we asked for people to start submitting help tickets, there were very few people who went ahead and submitted tickets. And when they did, the reported problems were often vague and difficult to reproduce. We would typically get help tickets that said, Journal of XYZ doesn't work in Summon. And then I would try to re reproduce that by finding an article in Journal XYZ and doing a search in Summon, and lo and behold, I could always find it. And after a while, we finally discovered that the reason that for this was that most problems were citation specific. It wasn't so much a problem with Journal of XYZ, it was this certain article from this certain issue of the certain volume of Journal of XYZ. And the real problem was that it was difficult for users to provide enough information for us to effectively diagnose issues. Most of the time when librarians were coming across the problems with Summon, it was during an instruction session or a reference interview, and they were more focused on trying to help the patron or teach the class than worrying about trying to jot down what the citation was and what search they used. And they would move on, and then by the time they got done with whatever they were doing, they would forget to go back or would be unable to go back and replicate the issue. So the solution we came up with this was user interfaces created an error reporting link, which we hard-coded into our Summon Results search page. 
We implemented this in April of 2013, which is a little bit over a year after we implemented Summon. And then uh, we began using it. Uh, the, it's implemented directly into the page. Someone clicks on that report broken link uh, button, which appears with all of our full text journal article results. And it pops up this little box for people to put in any information that they want to include about reporting the link. And it also harvests metadata directly from the search results page. So then whenever patrons click on the reported button, it sends an email to the Serials Electronic Resources main email inbox. And this email contains a lot of information harvested directly from Summon. Uh, in particular, it contains the full citation it contains the problem URL that the patron clicked on that resulted in the error. It also includes the search result URL so that we can see exactly what the search results page was where the link was located. This wasn't initially part of the harvested information, but we quickly learned that it helped us to troubleshoot if we could see what the patrons were seeing. And it also helped when we started reporting things to Summon to give them the search results page so they could see what we were seeing. It also includes any comments from the patrons. Now, the form does not require patron contact information. It does provide space for them to put their information, but we didn't really want to promote that initially because initially I was the only person handling these, and within the first month we had received over 200 error emails, which was a lot to keep up with along with my regular work. And after several months of trying to do this, it became unsustainable. We had a really huge backlog, and I began to train our staff members and several of our student workers to work on it. And as a matter of fact, now the summon error reporting is done almost exclusively by our student workers. And in the past four years, we've received over 7,347 error reports. And that number was pulled back uh, in April. So we have received several hundred more error reports in the time since then, but all of the Things I'll show you later on with numbers come from the basically the three years worth of, excuse me, four years worth of data. So our error reporting workflow, uh, the basic workflow, is that emails are placed in an active summon error folder within the serials ER inbox. And then whenever staff or students have time, they will go into the active summon error folder, pick a batch of about five to ten emails and move them to their own personal in-progress folder. And that's to make sure that we don't have multiple people trying to work on the same problem at the same time. Then once they select an email to work on, they'll open it up, click on the problem URL and the initial search result URL, so they have both open in the browser. And then they put on their detective hat because it's time to start asking lots and lots of questions. So the first question you need to ask is, is there an error message? A lot of times, whenever you click on the link, you'll get some sort of message that blatantly tells you there is a problem. So if there is an error message, you need to examine the error message for clues. But not all problems come with error messages. A lot of times, if there's no error message and it's a problem, it could be because of an issue with full text access. So if there's no error message, they need to check if the full text access is working. And then there's maybe there might be an error message, because there's some messages people get that might be easily mistaken for an error. The most common example is our open URL landing page that appears when we have a product that does not play well with open URL standard. So the link resolver can get people to the magazine or journal, but can't get them all the way to the journal article. And so they will land on a page that provides the information saying, we cannot take you directly to the article, but here's the journal where you can search and access it. And people often don't read that or misunderstand that and assume that it's an error that needs to be reported when really it's just the way that things are. So if there is an error message, you know, as I said, you examine things to see what needs to be done. And some common examples of error messages can include proxy not being configured correctly. And that's a pretty simple fix. We just notify the proxy admin and they will update the easy proxy stanzas for us. Sometimes you'll get a 404 error or website down error. And this could be because there have been some technical difficulties on the vendor side, but it also could be because links have changed, or their structure has changed, and that change hasn't been communicated to the knowledge base. So if it's just uh, technical difficulties, just wait for resolution. If it's a systematic change, then we will notify the knowledge base to update their info. 
sometimes you'll get a DOI not found message. In that case, we would verify what the correct DOI is and then report the error to whoever had the incorrect DOI. And finally, you'll get an error message saying this article document is not found. And if you get that error message, then it's time to ask more questions. So if the article isn't found, the first question you need to ask is, does it exist? First of all, you verify if it exists on the platform. Do searches, try to track it down. So if you can verify the article's existence on the target platform, then more than likely you're getting the error message because of some sort of citation or linking error. But if you can't find it on the platform, then you need to verify the article exists, period. You may need to go to the publisher site of the journal in question to confirm the actual citation. Typically, even if you don't have a subscription to it on the journal platform, then you can still see the table of contents and get the citation information to go back and see uh, if it exists. So if you verify that the article exists, you need to then say, should it be there on the target platform? So if you verify, first of all, you verify if the article is covered by the target provider's holdings. If it is, then you need to notify the provider that they're missing content. But if it's not covered by their holdings, you need to notify the knowledge base they need to update their holdings. But in either case, if you are trying to help people find the material, it's best to let them know that ILL is the quickest way to get the material. Because in my experience, whenever you are asking an aggregator to to load content that is missing, it can take a long time. I've had one case which it took over a year before we got the notice that the information or the file had been loaded. But even in uh, faster cases, it's usually at least a month before they're able to retrieve and load the missing material. So what if it kind of sort of exists? And this brings us to what's been the bane of my existence when dealing with uh, web scale discovery, and that's what's known as the granularity error. And granularity errors occur when the discovery product and content provider index at different levels. Um, it usually happens when there's a feature that's used regularly, like letters to the editor, book reviews, proceedings abstracts, et cetera, where there's a broad category and a whole bunch of little things underneath it. And one provider will do the broad category and one will do the more specific. And this is something that is typically unable to be fixed because neither side will re-index. Um, if you contact one, they'll say, well, the other person needs to re-index and vice versa. And it's understandable because it would take a large amount of time and money to do that, but it can be very frustrating for our users. And this problem has been what we in our department call an acknowledge and move on type of issue, where when we come across granularity issues, we now go, oh, it's granularity, mark it down in our stats, and move on because there's really nothing that we can do to fix. So I want to give an example of granularity. In my experience, the content provider usually indexes at the column or feature level. So the content provider might have letters to the editor, journal of complaints, number one, pages one through five. Whereas the Web Scale Discovery Service typically indexes at a much more granular level, it's like the individual letter or review. So they might index as What's With Kids Today, Journal of Complaints, number one, page two. So that letter is a subset of the larger one, but because of how open URL linking and matching works, it's gonna come across as an error. So that again, initially we reported all of those that we came across, but after basically getting the same reply over and over again that it wasn't them, it was the other person that needed to change, we moved to just acknowledging and moving on. So another question to ask is, is the citation correct? So if you have found the journal article existing on the target platform, but you're getting an article not found error, then it's most likely due to some sort of citation error. So the best thing to do is to take the full text of the article itself and compare the citation in the article to the metadata in both the discovery tool and the target platform. You need to pay close attention to all aspects, not just pagination or date or author name, but punctuation and diacritics, because something as simple as a semicolon instead of a colon can throw off the matching sometimes. Now, if you do find an error, you need to report the error to the responsible uh, products. Uh, if possible, include a link or a screenshot of the correct citation. Uh, because one of the universal rules of help desks is that they assume that you don't know what you're talking about. And so the more information you can provide up front to let them know that, yes, I do know what I'm talking about, the less back and forth there's going to be. 
and also be aware that there might be problems to report to both parties on either side of the link. Uh, my favorite example of this was a journal that had a volume number, an issue number, and a consecutive number that showed how many issues had been published since the dawn of time. One product had the volume number correct, but for the issue number had the consecutive number. The other product had the issue number correct, but had the consecutive number as the volume number. So they're both incorrect in very different ways. And if they'd been incorrect in the same way, then we never would have known about it because they would have matched. But since they were both wrong, we had to notify both sides to ask them to clean up their metadata. So what if it looks right, but it still is an error? So if the article is present and the citation is correct on both sides and you're still getting an article not found message, then it's probably a problem with the linking syntax. So it's something behind the scenes with the open URL linking or direct linking or any sort of linking that is set up with your discovery service. And in that case, it's best to just report the problems to your discovery products so that they can investigate because they're going to be the best equipped to handle that. Uh, this doesn't happen a lot necessarily, but sometimes uh, certain products can be very difficult to get uh, on board. We did have one product where for about a year, every one of the results for their databases that came up resulted in error because they did not play well with the linking syntax of Summon. And it became an acknowledge and move on situation where when they came up, we just said, oh, it's a known issue. We don't need to report it because it's being worked on. And thankfully that's been resolved but that problem still crops up from time to time. So going back to our is there or is there not an error message. So we've covered kind of what happens if there is an error message. But if there's not an error message, then you need to see can you access the full text? Because the error could be a full text article not opening for our patrons. So if the full text won't open, then you need to check that your subscription is current and paid up. And if it is current and paid up, reach out to your provider to claim access. And if it's not current and paid up, reach out to your provider to claim an invoice and get it current and paid up. Uh, check if the holdings and knowledge base are correct for what you have licensed. Uh, knowledge bases are an incredibly helpful tool, but there are sometimes lots of different options to choose from, and you need to make sure that you choose the right one. And sometimes, even if you think you've chosen the right one, there might be some little variations. So trust but verify when it comes to the default years for your publisher platforms. And if you have canceled a subscription, then update your knowledge base to uh, reflect that. Now, if there's no error message and the full text does open, you need to verify that the full text is for the correct article. We have had cases where the completely wrong article uh, gets pulled up. If the right article is pulled up, verify that it's not missing any pages and that all the pages are legible and not corrupted. If there are any problems found, notify the content provider. And if there are no problems found, then it's on to the final question, which is, what if there's no problem at all? And this happens a lot. And there's certain reasons, there could be certain reasons for that. Uh, the problem may have been resolved between time of reporting and time you're examining it. So some of those technical difficulties, if a website was down when people were trying to access it, and then by the time we are trying to access it, the website is up again. Uh, but there could also be issues where there was a citation problem that someone else had reported that had been fixed in, in between time. The problem may have been user specific. Um, and sometimes it's difficult to tell. Uh, it all depends on what sort of information they put in the comments box. And most of the time, the comments uh, aren't that helpful in determining if it's the problem on the user side or our side. But occasionally, there are a few clues. We can go, oh, well, it's a problem with their cookies or their firewall or whatever. And in one case, uh, one person's complaint was that the article was in French when they wanted it in English, even though it was a French language publication. So the problem there was that the patron had unrealistic expectations. Uh, but if we can't determine that there was a problem, then we just record the problem type as no problem and the problem source as not applicable. Uh, because you want to give our patrons the benefit of the doubt that they aren't the cause of the problem. Even if the majority of the time they probably are, if we can't prove that they're the problem, we for recording purposes, we record it as no problem discovered. So once we've gone through and identified the problem or not, and the responsible party has been notified, then the emails move to a completed folder. Uh, then we record statistics that include the type of problem we've determined and who we've determined as the cause in each individual worker's individual spreadsheets. 
And then any follow-up communications from the responsible parties are handled as necessary. And just be aware that you might get pushback from the web skill discovery uh, products saying that's actually a problem with the content provider and vice versa. The content provider will say, no, it's not our problem, it's their problem. The way that we typically handle this is once one product says you need to notify the other product, we will go ahead and do so. But then if we get pushback from the second party, then we will just email both of them and say, you have both been notified, please work it out amongst yourselves. And then we will move on because we don't have the time to act as referee between the two products. We've done our due diligence of notifying both of them of the issue and we hope that they will be able to work together to resolve it. Now, as I mentioned, we record things based on different problem types that we have assigned them. And they fall into basically three major categories. The first category is errors that we can report and fix. And these are errors where there is something concrete we can do to try and resolve it. We may not be able to resolve it ourselves, but we can at least reach out and contact someone who can resolve it. Then there are the no action taken problems. And those are things where there's really not much that we can do. Uh, we just, there's the granularity errors that we acknowledge and move on, but it's also things where, oh, the problem has already been solved by the time we get to see it, or it's a technical difficulty and there's nothing we can do but wait. And finally, there's the no problems identified, where we can't even verify that a problem ever existed. So you can see by percentage of problems by these main categories that the majority of the error reports that we've gotten, there is no problem that we can identify. So over 53% of the emails, there was no problem that we could uh, discern at all. Now 37% of the time, there was some sort of error that we could report or fix, and then 10% of the time, there was things that we just had to acknowledge and move on with. So some of the examples of the types of errors that we report and fix, uh, I've mentioned several of these already, and most of them are pretty self-explanatory, citation errors, DOI incorrect, et cetera. But there are a couple that I want to point out, uh, specifically the duplicate entry and summon results. And these typically occur whenever someone has brought in indexing from multiple sources and has not been able to completely dedupe the citations because one of the citations was faulty, and so it didn't get caught. And we stumbled upon them whenever the search results was retrieved both of those results and the person has clicked on the wrong one. So we will notify someone to ask them to remove or merge the entries. The other one is a knowledge base. So there are lots of issues that could be dealt, uh, held in the knowledge base, such as the holdings or the linking error. Uh, but the, whenever we use knowledge base as a type of error, it's never it returns false positives. So if we go into the knowledge base, we see that this product is not in our holdings, and yet this article is showing up in some search results. This has not happened a lot, but it is uh, something that happens upon occasion. So types of errors where we don't really take any action, uh, browser problems in the patron end, granularity, open access publishers not using open URL standards. So I mentioned earlier that we have people who report errors whenever they land on the open URL uh, page that says that they can't get directly to the article. And we have that as an option in the things that we'll report, but if it is an open access publisher, most of them are just not set up for that sort of thing, and so we learn quickly again, acknowledge and move on. So if it's an open access publisher that winds up on the open URL landing page, we just mark it as open access and move on. So here's some numbers uh, break down. So you can see again, you know, over 3,800 of the problems that we encountered are no problems. Then the next highest one, almost 900 examples of linking error, and I would say the vast majority of those are from the one publisher or aggregator who did not play well with someone for well over a year. And since that has been resolved, those numbers have stopped growing. I also want to point out the one user error down at the bottom. So we do have a category of user error. It has been used exactly once, and that was the patron who wanted an English article from a French language journal. So we also break up in our statistics who we have determined is the cause of the error. Where did the breakdown happen? So we have five basic categories, and you can see the 
the one with the highest percentage is the discovery service slash knowledge base. We kind of combine them together for our statistical purposes. So the highest percentage of errors do happen at that level, but those errors don't even make up half of the problems that we encounter. And this percentage is based off of just actual problems, does not include the no problems. So out of actual problems that we've identified, less than half are caused by the discovery web, the discovery product, which kind of flies in the face of our liaisons assuming that all problems were someone's fault. You can see the next highest one is aggregators who are nearly 37% of the problem, followed by publishers, UNT itself, and by UNT means basically me, and then uh, patrons. So even though discovery makes up a large portion of the problem, there are lots of different factors that go into it. So one of the benefits of the error reporting workflow, well, first of all, by providing a reporting link for patrons, it helps alleviate some of their frustration over encountering problems. If they can know that someone is working on the problem and ask to be notified once the problem is resolved, then it's not as bad as just seeing an error message and not being able to do anything about it. It's also brought many issues to our attention which might have gone unreported otherwise. And I'm not just talking about the, the citation level issues, but we have learned about problems that we had in our knowledge base holdings, our proxy configurations. We often find out about problems with that through this rather than people reporting the proxy problems as a separate thing. So there's lots of things that we were able to fix because of this new workflow that if people had to go out of their way to report, we probably never would have heard about. And also the data we've gathered has been really useful in educating our public service librarians about how web scale discovery works and what the types of problems are that we, re we encounter and how helpful their reporting the errors can be. And since we started doing the error reporting workflow and reporting back to them, we have seen a big change in the attitude towards Summon. It's gone from something that liaisons avoid to something that they do teach in their uh, bibliographic instruction classes and use in their reference interviews. And finally, any problem we report is one less problem someone else will stumble across. So we like to think that we're doing our small part to make things easier for the rest of you who are dealing with web skill discovery so that maybe the error that we reported won't be one that one of your patrons will stumble across. Now I mentioned at the beginning that there is a little bit of an update from whenever I did this presentation uh, back in June. And one of the things I had mentioned at that presentation that we were thinking about making a slight change to our workflow, and since June we have implemented it. And that is we now have added a prompt for patron info to the error reporting link. Now, as I said, people could include information in the comments before, but their contact information would be kind of buried in the comments and we didn't really prompt them to include information. But now that we have the workflow running smoothly and our workloads are, are pretty stable, I felt that it was a good idea after reviewing all these numbers for the presentation to set up a way for our patrons to feel comfortable providing their information so that we can reach out to them. Because with over 3,800 examples where there was really no problem and we could just send people a link directly to the product, uh, we knew it was something that we needed to implement. So now when people click on that link, it gets the same dialog box, but now there's a separate line that has the, the text, if we locate this item, at what email address may we contact you? And now when they put in their email address, it's separated out from the comments as its own separate line. So we can easily browse through the error reports that we've gotten, find those that do have contact information, and then address those first before we address the ones where no one is waiting on a response. And our responses are basically, if we are able to find the content, we will provide the patron with a permalink. Sometimes we'll do a permalink to a different product, but we do give them a permalink to the article in some way, shape, or form. If they reply back that they're still not able to access, we'll provide them with troubleshooting instructions. Uh, we have some very basic troubleshooting that we provide to people uh, regarding firewalls, corrupted cookies, the VPN, etc. And we'll also give them information for how to con contact our computer support help desk in the library because if our basic troubleshooting information can't help them, then it's pretty much beyond our capabilities to walk them through the, the troubleshooting. And if we can't give access to them, we will provide them with interlibrary loan information. 
Now, we started this a couple weeks after the NASA conference in June, and over the summer, a little over a third of the error reports we received included the patron contact information. But since the semester started, we received uh, close to a little bit over 300 error reports, and a little over 150 of those had included patron contact information. So about half of the error reports you're getting now have patrons saying, yes, please contact me, and we're able to reach out to them and provide them with the material they need, and again, hopefully relieve some of the frustration they feel and be good uh, examples of customer service to our patrons. So that is my presentation. I know I talked way too fast because it's barely over 30 minutes <laughs> into the presentation, and I apologize. Uh, if you want more information about our uh, workflows and how everything works, feel free to contact me. Uh, if you have any questions about how exactly does that broken link button work in terms of putting it in the page or harvesting metadata, et cetera, et cetera, do not contact me because I have no idea. Instead, contact our user interfaces guru, Jason Tamale, who is the one who set it up and can answer all of your technical questions. And with that, I am ready to answer any questions you may have. All right. Um, hi, Todd. I have a question. Okay. Um, so I think from what I heard, you've been talking about troubleshooting for uh, like articles and uh, databases maybe as well. Um, so uh, how, how do you guys handle uh, e-books? Do you e-book the, the data, data pipeline different from uh, uh, your articles? I mean, how, how do your patrons discover ebooks? Uh, for ebooks, they are able to discover ebooks if they go into the Summon database, but we actually have a, uh, a, a homegrown bento box search that searches our catalog and Summon and other resources, and that's usually how uh, ebooks are discovered. Uh, if they are discovered in Summon, we do have the report broken link available on any full text material. So if they do come across a, an ebook and it's not working, they can click on the report broken link. But I will say that in all the time I've doing it, I have had maybe one or two ebooks where people have actually reported the broken link. Because typically with those, the links work better than the uh, article links because there's not as much variation in the metadata and citations for journal articles. So ebook problems are usually crop up through other uh, ways than through the through summon. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. Let me see if any. Okay. Here's a question from uh, Esther, um, and she's asking, how did you train student staff to resolve errors? What was that process like? It's very complicated. <laughs> Um, one of the things I discovered early on when trying to train people is that for me, a lot of time it's just instinctual almost at this point. After being in electronic resources for over a decade, I can typically look at something and go, oh, well, here's the problem. And trying to train the students in that has been very, very uh, interesting exercise. Uh, usually uh, how the training will work is I will sit with the student and have them watch me as I go through several different things. And then I'll sit and watch them go through several different things. And it's usually a several days worth of training one-on-one uh, -on -one individually with them. Um, we have really tried to step up the criteria we use for hiring our student workers over the last several years. Uh, we have tests that we use to kind of gauge their analytic abilities to a certain degree uh, to kind of make sure that we're getting people in who might have the capacity to do this sort of thing. But it is uh, uh, pretty, pretty difficult sometimes. And we have had students who just have not excelled at it, and we've just said, okay, this, your brain does not work that way. We have other work to do. You'll focus on this other task, and we won't, a, uh, we won't have you be this as your primary duty. And we do have some instructions uh, typed up to kind of give them some guidance on how to deal with certain things, but it is a, uh, it is a difficult thing to train people how to do, do troubleshooting. It is, uh, takes a certain mindset and a certain willingness to think outside the box sometimes. So it is, it's been rewarding to have the, our students uh, res respond well to it. We have had students who their eyes just glaze over and it's not fun. 
Okay. Uh, yeah, um, that's great. I think I have another question here from Rutgers University. Uh, what happens? Oh, hold on. <laughs> okay, here's a question. The first question from them. What happens when questions are reported to the reference desk chat service? Um, if someone does not go through the, the broken link and just reports it to the reference desk, they will usually forward those things on to our computer help desk, uh, our technology computing office, or TACO as uh, the acronym. So they'll report it to TACO, and then TACO will try to take care of it themselves or will reach out to, to, to our department if it's something that falls into our wheelhouse. So the reference people will usually, sometimes they'll report to both of us uh, depending on the person, but typically reference people will just forward on the complaints to, to one of those two, and then we will work together to get it resolved. Okay, great. Um, another question from Rodgers is, uh, how many staff, okay, hold on, this seems to smooth. How many staff student workers participate in your troubleshooting workflow? So right now, the bulk of the work is actually done by one student worker, where it's the, the majority of their time. We have, did have at one point uh, two staff members and two student workers working out whenever we first started and had a really large uh, backlog, but now that the backlog is completely cleared, one student worker is able to keep on top of things. Um, we're getting ready to train another student worker on it because that student worker is about to graduate uh, in May, so we want to make sure we have someone else trained before he leaves so we have someone else uh, ready to, to step in. But right now, we're able to have one person, one student worker do it, and then if that student is out, for an extended period of time, then one of the staff members will step in and take up the, the slack while that student is out. But uh, even though we still have a steady stream of reports, it kind of ebbs and flows depending on the time of the semester, and usually it's not much problem to keep on top of for one, one student worker as the majority of their job. Okay, here's another question from Esther is, who do you report the data about the problems to? Cool. Yeah. Uh, so whenever we report the problems, it, it varies. Uh, for for Summon, they have their own, you know, the, the Ex Libris troubleshooting uh, account where we'll log in. Same thing for Serial Solutions. We'll report that to them. And for different publishers, it's just a uh, some for aggregators. They often have like EBSCO and ProQuest will typically have a nice problem reporting. Uh, form that we can put the information in. And for publishers, you know, sometimes they have a problem form, sometimes we have to try and track down an email address to email. And some don't have any contact information at all and we'll do our do our best, but uh, I will say there's one one provider who requires that you call in to do any sort of technical uh, reporting and we just don't do that because it's not a good use of our time and energy to sit on the phone and try to read full citations to, and URLs to somebody. So, uh, but we just try and find out the the most appropriate person. Some some will have forms, some will have troubleshooting desks, some we just have to do what we can do to to get a hold of somebody. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Yeah, I know Sierra Solutions. They have a online uh, ticket system, and you can report issues to it, right? Okay. Yeah. Uh, Serious solutions. Yeah, I'm talking. Yes. About. Yes. Okay. I do have a couple other questions. Let's see. Okay. Here's another one from Rodgers here. Uh, what tool platform do you use for recording stats? Uh, right now, we're, we just have an Excel spreadsheet for okay. for this. We just uh, each, each uh, person has their own spreadsheet set up where they record their stats and then. When needed, I will pull stats from the individual spreadsheets to put into a master spreadsheet. But for the most part, it's we really started recording these stats just for our own edification. We don't really report it anywhere, but it's just kind of I started just to kind of get an idea of what type of problems we were encountering, and then was able to use it to you know build this presentation and kind of give presentations to workers and use it for training purposes, but for the most part, the stats are just for internal use and just for our own edification. Okay. Um, here's another question from uh, Tosca. I think it's more about uh, holding. So the question is, how do you customize collections? 
For example, in the back end, you can turn a whole collection on, but what if you do not own a couple titles? Um, we, use, we use WMS, OCLC, and I have to use keyboard. How do you deal with this in summons? Uh, well, since we use uh, serial solutions as our uh, knowledge base, it varies from product to product. So if it's an aggregator database, then you have to take it as is. You say, yes, we subscribe to Academic Search Complete, and so we have access to everything. Uh, when it comes to publisher platforms, we do have a lot of control over whether we subscribe to all products or not, and then for individual products, they have the option for us to put in custom end dates and begin dates for things. So you, you can rely on their defaults or you can put in the custom dates. But that, again, is only for uh, journal uh, publisher providers. And if it's a more of an aggregator database, we cannot turn on or turn off or alter any of the dates ourselves. So you'd have to contact them. And that's because it is a, a one-size-fits-all database, whereas with the individual publishers, you know, it can depend on when you started your subscription or when you canceled your subscription. But Serious Solutions doesn't make it pretty easy uh, to, to go in and, and edit those and customize those. So that's, uh, mm -hmm. that's what we do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, do you do anything in summons? No, uh, all of that is, uh, all the holding stuff is all done through the knowledge base. Okay. So a uh, summon, summon is, uh, uses the knowledge base as its a, uh, information mm -hmm. source. So any changes that need to be done with that happens in the knowledge base and not in summon itself. The only sort of things that we can do with, with summon is affect how things display and what the defaults are for displays and filters and things like that. But when it comes to holdings, that all happens at the knowledge base level. Okay, great. Um, there's another question from Gregory Murray. Uh, you have had a summon for a long time. Just hold on, this question just show up again. Uh, uh, have you seen a decrease in the number of errors over time? Um, that's a good question. I actually haven't broken it down. A, a, to, to see see if there's been a, a decrease yet. That's something that I would like to look at. Um, like I said, I feel like it really does ebb and flow on during the semester. It kind of depends on how many people are using products. I think I think it has decreased slightly, but I can't I can't say for sure. Uh, it's not that's not a number I thought to look at before this presentation, unfortunately. But it is something I will look at moving forward to see if we can see if there's been a change or not. Okay. All right. And another question from Rodgers again. Um, does a student worker report a problem directly to the publisher vendor? Yes. We, we trust our students to contact the, the people directly. They, our students set up their own accounts for uh, serial solutions and summon error reporting and they contact everything directly. The only time that I'm brought in, there are certain things, like if we need to claim invoicing, they'll let me do that because they don't have the experience with that. But anything that's a basic, hey, the data is wrong, they'll report that. But if it's something more complex or something where it requires financial information being handled, then they will pass it on to me to handle. But the vast majority of the time, uh, it is handled directly by our students, directly to them. I would say I maybe get one or two emails a, a week that I have to step in on, uh, but for the most part, it's the students doing everything. Okay. Okay, and I think I have a couple more questions here. We still have uh, over 10 minutes. All right. So here's one from Radiger Skin. Do you have your error reporting form embedded anywhere aside from discovery? Uh, for example, ebook platform databases. Right now, it is solely for Summon. On our other uh, product, on our library web page, there are different ways for people to uh, uh, report errors, but nothing that harvests the information the way that Summon does. Um, and that's something I'm, I'm assuming that Summon was more easily. Uh, uh, the word is assuming, but uh, it's easier for people to go into Summon and, and change the, uh, the HTML code and the JavaScript code or whatever code they're using. Easier for them to do that in that than being able to do it in other databases. Um, I don't think that we would have the ability to do that, but because we do have a certain amount of control over the display of Summon, a, uh, 
we're able to, to do that, but not in other cases, no. All right, one more question from Rodgers. What is the average turnaround time? Uh, typically, uh, now, when a problem is reported, it's usually uh, probably a 24-hour turnaround. Like, for the time we get it, like our student, the student worker who works on it, he works four days out of the week. So on those days, he usually cleans out the uh, active folder while he's there. And then on the days now he's not there, then one of the others of us will will do it if we have time. So if someone reports it on a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, there might be a little more of a lag. But if they report it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, then we're usually able to get it uh, turned around within a day. But the most two or three two or three working days at the most usually. Okay. Um, one more question. This is a question from Tina Adams um, asking: Is the report for broken links the, the Google form that is submitted to a central email? Um, it is. Uh, it's not a Google form. Uh, mm -hmm. It is. Uh, it's. It harvests the, the information, sends an email to the serials ER units uh, communal inbox. Mm -hmm. uh, so whenever they click that link, it harvests the data and sends an email to the the lib serials at unt.edu inbox that all of the serials staff and students have access to, and then I will. Uh, Move, move them from the active, or move them to the active serial box, and then people move from the active box to their individual boxes. But it's uh, I, again, I don't know all the specifics, the, the technical details of how the form works. That was, that's Jason's department. I just know what to do when I get them. So. Okay. Um, all right. Here's a question from Martin and Patrick asking: How many hours does student work to work? Does he just work during the day, or are after hours problem handled? Uh, he just works during the day. Uh, he currently works, I believe, 20 hours a week. Uh, he's last semester he worked. Uh, he works between 20 and 25 hours a week, depending on the, the class schedule in the semester. Uh, but our office, uh, the, the we're located off campus in the library annex, and our hours are basically eight to five. So if it comes in after that, it has to wait until the next day. So it's definitely not a real-time reporting, uh, but it does have basically eight through, we're open eight to five Monday through Friday. So if it happens on the weekends or at night, then it has to wait until the next business day during business hours to be uh, resolved. But currently our student who works on it works about 20 hours a week. And I would say it probably is, this is maybe at the most half of his of his time is spent doing doing this. Uh, maybe it can go anywhere from a quarter to half of his time, depending on the time of semester and the amount of people who are using the product and reporting the errors. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, one more question from uh, Marty. Do you also try to keep the world share knowledge base up to date, the collection manager up to date? No. No, we don't we don't use a world share knowledge base. Uh, at all, you know, we we have our basic holdings in WorldCat, but we don't have any of our e-journal holdings in in there uh, right now. Okay. Uh, since we used to, but once when there were solutions, would update them regularly. We had them in, but if there were changes and they don't do that anymore, we don't have those holdings. But so we don't use that. We just use serial solutions as our as our knowledge base. Is the only place where we maintain our our holdings. All right. Um. I don't see any other questions coming. Um, I mean, if if everyone still have any questions, you can uh, type them in through Q and A, and the chat is okay too. A lot of questions came in from the chat today. Um, okay, we still have a couple minutes. Um, I mean, if no other questions, I think you know this is a. Yeah, this is great, Todd, and I want to thank you for um, sharing this with us. Uh, it's very helpful. Uh, myself, as electronic resource librarians, every day I deal with uh, um, uh, access issues, uh, mostly I work with yearbooks, but yeah. I know it's that sometimes you want to pull your hair out, but this is great, um, knowing some of the strategies and the categories, the issues, and what the best strategy to handle it. Um, Okay, all right, great. Thank you. Thank you um, to our speakers.
and also I want to thank everybody for coming to this webinar. We hope to see you at our next continuing education webinars. Okay, great. Thanks, everybody. All right, thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm.